thank you again, everyone, for joining us today. <clears throat> Beautiful um, rainy day in October here. Um, and we do apologize. We have postponed this meeting from the first Tuesday of the month uh, um, to a um, couple of Tuesdays back. But we will be back on the, um, the time we had, which is the first Tuesday of every month. Um, I'm so happy to have all of you join us today for this call um, where we get to share a lot of updates from across agencies, uh, from DEED and from all our partners. And then at the end of the call, we do welcome uh, every one of you to share and, and join our open forum and ask as much questions as you can and maybe suggest also where you want us to cover um, the next uh, meetings. Um, our next meeting uh, as, for, as for now is on Tuesday the 7th, <clears throat> which is in two weeks. And we do hope to get back to our first uh, Tuesday schedule. Uh, thank you so much. I do have to mention this call is recorded um, and uh, we will post the, um, uh, the recording and of course uh, a blog that we create um, after every call in our website. So you can always go back and listen to the recording and also uh, read the blog that we do after every call. And then of course we will share <clears throat> some of the pre presentations as per your requests and we will uh, be happy to, um, of course, follow up with any questions and any comments after the call. I'll go ahead and just start on from this from Deed, and then of course, welcome um, uh, our first speaker um, in, in a bit. But before I get to, um, to our uh, Deed updates, I wanna reiterate the reason why we're all <clears throat> here, why we're all doing the work that we do, um, which is the importance of having immigrants and refugees in our state. Uh, we work up every day to, to do this work. And a lot of us, you our partners are working with us to make sure that um, the state's uh, immigrant and refugee communities um, get the help they need, state resources they need, and of course, tackle the barriers that they face every day to, uh, for their uh, employment and economic development endeavors. So this morning, I had the pleasure of attending um, our, our partners, our, our friends at DHL, DHS. They had um, the you know, refugee award that happens every year. And it was so empowering to listen to the, um, to the uh, speeches by the awardees and um, the, the impact they have on their communities. These are the kind of stories that empower all of us to, um, to continue the work that we do. And it's just so uh, much. Uh, work that is done every day and we don't get to talk about it. So I wanna take a moment and appreciate everyone that does every work that they do um, every day. We are here to support you. This office and all our partners are here to support the work that you do. And so uh, um, I just wanna take another moment to show that um, still the idea of welcoming immigrants is not new. Um, America, this nation is um, is, is, it was founded by people who had the, um, the vision and who knew the importance of welcoming and equity, um, you know, equal freedom for all. And that means welcoming and making sure we help each other to, um, um, to be more inclusive in our society and to make sure we open doors for those of us who are coming here. Minnesota is not an exception to any of the other states that are uh, you know, welcoming immigrants and refugees into the states. We do have a lot of statistics that show that uh, as we continue uh, our economic trajectory, our economic development trajectory, uh, and immigrants and refugees have been part of that process. I mean, uh, when we talk about the close to half a million um, immigrants or foreign born, uh, population in Minnesota, about 470 something, I'm assuming, um, you know, a few, that's 8.5% of the state's population that, that is um, foreign born. And that includes, of course, very much diverse uh, immigrant and refugee communities in Minnesota. And as you also should know that, um, you know, you know, foreign born populations are much newer in Minnesota, uh, as opposed to other um, states, for example, it shows that up to 27% um, of our immigrant and refugee population have arrived in Minnesota after 2011. And um, another 30% um, have arrived in Minnesota from 20, 2000 to 2011. 
that shows less than half of the immigrant and refugee population in Minnesota has arrived after 2000 uh, compared to other states that had a, you know, a much more um, of their populations, more than 50% of their immigrant foreign, foreign born populations uh, before the 2000 period. So that's a, a young, um, you know, um, kind of a population that we have in Minnesota. And of course, the uh, labor force and the workforce change that has been happening for the past two decades have been led mainly by immigrants and refugees into in, in our state. Um, some numbers put it at about you know, 67 or 74 percent. Um, no, that's seven, that the workforce participation is about 74 percent, but um, we have had a, about you know close to 60 percent of our workforce change for the past two decades driven by by by, by immigrants. All this is to say that we have a lot of stake welcoming um, and, and you know our refugee and immigrant communities into the state, and this is part of what we do. It's part of our economic development trajectory. It's part of the fabric of Minnesota. And so I just wanted to make sure that I, I, I say those words to encourage everyone the work we do. Uh, as for deed, we have had a couple of um, um, grants and, 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 and um, contract opportunities that are posted in our website. I'd like to do these updates in detail, but I will refer you to our website as well. Uh, one noted um, uh, grant that's available in our state, in, in our website right now is the, of course, the, uh, the, the dry for five, which we have been all excited about. And please do make sure you follow up with any questions you have about the drive for five. We, there will be webinars that we will we'll put out and make sure that you, um, you are part of the, uh, um, um, the process. And we wanna make sure we increase those outreach for everyone. There's another MDH grant that was just recently shared with, but I will put those in the link in the chat and I would um, welcome our next speaker from our, our, our partners at DHS. Thank you, uh, Abdul Wahab. I am Rochelle King with the Department of Human, I'm not, yes, the Department of Human Services and the Resettlement Programs Office. Um, and as the Assistant Commissioner mentioned, we um, were together this morning in a really wonderful celebration to recognize people who arrived um, with a humanitarian protection status and are contributing to our community. Communities. So um, as a follow up to this, I'll send new arrivals and civic engagement as well as a young leader award. And so I will um, send out the press release so you can see who those people are. Um, also note that they will be um, pieces of their story will also be posted on our website soon. So as soon as that comes out, we'll make sure that everybody gets those as well. Um, a second um, update that I wanted to share is um, the resettlement programs office here at DHS, we are growing. So we've got several positions that are actually posted right now and are looking for some awesome people um, like uh, the assistant commissioner was talking about that are compelled and driven to make Minnesota a welcoming place um, and support newcomers. Um, so I will also as a follow up. So with the the news release on the outstanding the, the recognition event i'll also send out a link to on um, the four positions that we have posted right now um also in that um when you get that just note that i it, there will be um, also a link to sign up for our newsletter um at uh, department of human services so that when future um announcements come out about position postings or funding that we have then you'll be you'll be you'll get it hot off the presses um so just encourage you to sign up for that as well um, the last thing that I will say before introducing uh, other of my colleagues from DHS is just to provide a highlight um, to people um, that I will also send in the link to make sure that people are aware of the resource of um, the Department of Justice, Immigrant and Employee Rights section. So there's a lot of um, changes that have been happening, um, a lot of complicated statuses, right, for people who are new here, who um, may well be authorized to work, but that their employers aren't familiar with the different kinds of documentation that people have. Um, the Department of Justice has a really awesome help helpline for both um, uh, employers 
as well as for workers. And so I just want to make sure people have access to that. If you're working with somebody or you are someone who um, has work authorization, but the employer, your employer is not recognizing the documentation you have, these people like answer the phone and they actually help solve problems to help get people um, make sure that they can work. So that's the, the third thing that I will send out to everyone. Uh, and with that, I, I see uh, my colleague Redwan um, here. And so we've invited um, colleagues um, from Department of Human Services to talk about some exciting developments, share information about some future investment, state dollars investment to support new Americans in long-term care and health professions. So Redwan, I'm gonna turn the mic over to you. Thank you, uh, Abdul Wahab and uh... Uh, my name is Redwan Hamza. I am uh, with Minnesota Department of Human Services. Uh, I am with in a aging and disability services administration. We have a gear division, what's called Grant Equity Access and Research Division, uh, within within ATSA. Uh, our primary responsibility for this division is a grant making to support home and community based services. So. We have about $150 million in, in budget in grant that we are uh, trying to get out to the community over the next uh, five, five, six years. So that is uh, our task. I believe our director, Carol Anthony, is also in this call. So if you have questions, we will, uh, we will take that on after. So the reason that I'm, I'm here is that I will give you an overview of a new American uh, long-term care workforce development uh, and the request for information that we released. Uh, first, I will talk about the, the recent legislative appropriation uh, for this program. Uh, you may know this, but uh, in 2023, the Minnesota legislative session established the new American legal services and long-term workforce grant program. Uh, which will, will be in part to provide specialized services uh, and support to new Americans to enter the long-term care workforce. This is a one-time appropriation of about uh, $28 million uh, to be spent uh, between fiscal year 24 to 27, uh, which means that we are in fiscal year 24 now. So this grant would go uh, until the end of uh, June 30th, 2027. Uh, the way the session defined new American is an individual born abroad and the individual's children irrespective of their immigration status. This is how the session defines uh, the new Americans. So this grant will support the specialized services for recruitment and the connection of new Americans to long-term employment opportunities, including developing connections to employment with long-term care employers and potential uh, employees, providing recruitment training, guidance, mentorship, and other support services necessary to encourage employment, retention, and successful community integration. Uh, the program also provides career education, wraparound services, and job skills training in high demand healthcare and long-term field. Paying for program expenses related to long-term professions, including supportive services uh, to help participants attend class, uh, such as childcare, transportation, mental health supports, and also the program expense related to long-term care professions, including, uh, but not limited to hiring uh, instructors and navigators, space rental support services to help participants attend uh, classes, including, but not limited to, you know, course fees, child care, transportation, tuition fee. Uh, this is what the program established. This is what the legislative language were for this program. Right now, in order for us to implement this program, we also would like to hear 
from communities who are working uh, with new Americans, uh, be it community service organizations, through settlement agencies, anyone who is working with new Americans, we will uh, we are soliciting information, you know, to implement this program. This, what is this that we are looking for is that we just released a request for information to solicit ideas that will inform us to develop a request for proposal from organizations working with new Americans, as I say. The RFI was released uh, on, on the 16th last week, and uh, we will have the RFI open until November 20th. So it's about four weeks from, to, uh, from, from this week that this RFI will remain open um, for, for, the, for the feedback. What is this that we are looking for? We are looking for an activities from organizations working relationship and experience with new Americans. Uh, how best, best to address new American needs to provide specialized services and support to enter the long-term workforce. How best to support them in achieving employment training and education as they settle and pursue their life in this new country? What type of supportive services are most important to help new Americans achieve employment in long-term care or other fields? What are the barriers? We would like to also know, we'd like to know what the barriers are so that we can address those barriers through this uh, funding opportunity. Uh, what type of culturally responsive services or supports are needed to help new Americans achieve employment or stay retained in employment? What, again, what are the barriers for, you know, for new Americans to attain employment and how do we best address uh, through this grant? What might you, you know, what other thing that, you know, the agencies that are working with new Americans would like to let us know as we design to launch this RFP uh, in the next uh, few months. So this is what we are looking from agencies who are working with, with new Americans. And uh, I believe if you haven't seen the RFP, I will share the RFP in, uh, in, in the chat uh, right now. And then for those of you that haven't seen, please use this link uh, to see the RFI and then we are also asking to have uh, this RFI submitted via an online portal that we have developed. Uh, it is, the link is available. So this is what we are looking for in order to um, have better informed as we develop this program. And the, the kind of information that as much information as we, we can from agencies working with new Americans to effectively use these, these resources and to come up with a better uh, program that will support the new Americans as they enter the, the long-term care workforce. Uh, our division director, Carol Anthony, is also here. Carol, uh, do you want to chime in if, if I miss anything? Hi, everyone. Um, no, Red One, you didn't miss anything, but I will introduce myself and just say uh, thank you and happy to be here. All right, with that, um, I did uh, share a link in the chat. Uh, and uh, if anyone uh, would like to see, or if in the form of an email, we will be able to send this out uh, to anyone who is interested, please, please let us know. Should we take a question here or we should be doing that later, uh, Abdi? Yes, um, I will invite anyone who has a question to either type it in or please um, just place your hand or mute yourself uh, to ask a question. Since we have a, a smaller team today, we will we'll, um, be happy to uh, take the questions. Um, again, this is a new opportunity to um, really drive the economic growth of Minnesota uh, by through employment. Um, and of course, doing the, the, the work that we have always been doing, um, creating a skilled workforce. So I understand that maybe I can ask the first question. There are uh, the idea of 
development, workforce development from this grant is to really work with um, uh, employers to also um, create some sort of a professional development within the track. Uh, for example, if someone joins in as a CNA, can they continue? Or is there some sort of a, a plan for professional development for new, new Americans who are coming into the long-term care? Um, and, and again, this might be starting this process, but I just wanted to put out there, it's something that's in the minds of a lot of folks within the community. Yes, I, this is Carol Anthony. I can I can uh, speak to that. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. Um, so, professional development and career advancement is a a major component of what we would like these grants to be able to support. Um, as Red Wan said, it was it's a very comprehensive. We're hoping that the grants are very comprehensive and and that in the supports and services that they provide. So it is beyond. Um, we want to go beyond uh, supporting people to enter the long-term care workforce, but also to really provide uh, career advancement, uh, professional development, mentorship, so that they can really, to really support their career and advancement in the long-term care field. So that's a really great question. Thank you. Um, some of the other um, issues that we hear, um, and this is not just in the long-term care, but also other, other industries, is for um, the language access issue. Um, and, uh, you know, some of the employers, it's very easy uh, for them to hire someone who is still working on their on their ESL, a limited English speaker. Um, uh, so what do you say to those uh, folks who, who wanna professionally develop, but also uh, see the, the limited language as a barrier to, um, you know, investing their uh, workforce in uh, to the long-term care. I couldn't find my unmute, um, but, and Red One, feel free to, to chime in, but this is absolutely part of the grant program that we want to develop is the support, whether it be language um, supports uh, as well as, and I should also note that um, that this, this would be absolutely something that is covered by the grant program and, and to support the worker um, with the needs that they would, with whatever needs they should they have to maintain or retain their employment or grow in their career. Um, I also want to note that these grants are also to really support uh, long-term care employers as well and how they can best serve their employees who happen to be new Americans or to recruit and retain um, new American employees so that they can really be supportive, inclusive, um, and culturally responsive providers. So the, the funding can all, will also go to, to those efforts as well because we understand that it, it really, it, it, um, both, it's a two-way street, so to speak, of, of supporting both uh, the, the employee and the employer to be successful. Yeah, I think uh, I mean, the language, uh, the statue language is broad enough to cover what you just said. And it is, you know, uh, by all means, uh, whatever that would support the new Americans enter the long-term care workforce. Uh, and we have seen over, over the last three, three years, uh, uh, within starting COVID or, or post COVID that there are severe workforce shortages um, in every areas, but I think the long-term care workforce is actually much more impacted by that. And uh, anything that, that need to be done, uh, this language, this session, uh, this statue is broad enough to, to support um, in any way that, 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 that is possible, be it at the employer level or, or people looking to enter the, the long-term workforce. Thank you, those are really uh, great. I just wanted to, uh, to point those two, information, two uh, issues out a lot. They come out a lot, the professional development and the language of test. Uh, but again, this is something that we wanna, uh, and dear, just thank you for, for all the work you do. And of course, also inviting the community partners to contribute, that's why you have the RFI. Uh, so I really encourage everyone 
to um, have that in mind and, and please do contact directly uh, to the DHS team. Uh, that's part of the, what we do. Our Office of New Americans wants to get you um, or to get you to know the information and have that access to state resources. I don't want to forget Lydia uh, typed something in the chat and said, I'm wondering if the provisions of the emergency of emergency and long-term care, long-term housing can be included in the wraparound services. Um, again, Lydia is wondering if the provision of emergency and long-term housing can be included in the wraparound services. Yeah, I think the statute in the, says that uh, wraparound services. So I think one of the things that we are, we would like to hear from providers out there like, like Lydia is that what is this that when we say emergency housing, what is this, what is this that we are talking about, obviously. So if you can uh, include um, your visions on how this uh, will address the, the, the long-term care uh, needs and then the entry for the new Americans, uh, we would really love to hear from you rather than saying yes or no at this point, I think it would be best to see what you will bring to the table so that we can evaluate that uh, as it fits uh, within the parameters of the, the legislation and its, its intent. Yes, Lydia, I would, I would recommend, I would really encourage you to uh, respond to the request for information because as Red One stated, we're really, we are create, we are in the development portion of this grant program to, to, you know, within the parameters of the legislation. So making sure that, making sure that we get the information that we, need, that we need to know so we can make this program as comprehensive as possible. So yes, we encourage you to respond to us. Thank you so much, uh, Redouan and Carol, um, for 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 the, the discussion and the great information that you shared with our uh, community partners. We will um, love to um, have forward any questions we get uh, following this call to you, and make sure you and, and everyone gets out the information. I will also record this information and do a blog a post, and then share that as well, so we can reach to many other folks that who could not make it to the to the call today. So um, thank you so much. I'm really glad to have you here. And we will go ahead and move to the next speaker. Um, Ray is here to talk about an amazing uh, program, an innovative um, program that Dee has been working on. And uh, uh, I'll let you take care, take from here, Ray. Thank you, sir. So yeah, my name is Ray McCoy and I actually just came on board as the Employer Reasonable Accommodation Fund Program Coordinator, which is about a couple of weeks ago. And I'll just get everything set up here and kind of go through and tell you what that's about. So, share my screen. There we go. That's a small slideshow. I'm more used to Teams than. So, there you go. All right, we're good. We're good. And we're good. so, like I said, I'm the program coordinator with um, Employer Reasonable Accommodation Fund, or briefly known as ERAF. This is a two year pilot program that reimburses eligible employers for some sort of reasonable accommodation made for things like job applicants and or employees with disabilities. So any reimbursement purchases made between July 1st of this year through June 30th of 2025, they're eligible for reimbursement. Our goal is to promote the hiring of people with disabilities by reducing any real or perceived financial hardships by providing accommodations. This is available to you know, employers, both small and medium size, and I'll get into what that, you know, entails, but small and medium size employers throughout the state of Minnesota. And we have appropriated, or we have been given like $2 million to operate this program with 300 of it budgeted for administrative costs. Currently housing for state services of the blind, but 
at the same time we're marketed through the deed program. So in a way, I'm kind of wearing two hats here. And we officially launched on the 1st of September. So to kind of get more into the meat and potatoes, like I said, the employer has to be domiciled within the boundaries of Minnesota. And as it has to be this, you know, principal place of business. In order to qualify or be considered a small or medium sized employer, it has to, your, the business has to have no more, no, yeah, no more than 500 employees on any day. And it cannot generate any more than 5 million in gross annual revenue. Just a little bit of an example of what, you know, counts as a reasonable accommodation. And these are just some examples. This doesn't like, you know, give you the entire gamut of it. So things like assistant, assistive technology, ergonomic workstations or seating, job coaching, which is what we get a lot of, um, low vision aids and devices, wheelchair ramps, or transcription of materials into braille or audio formats. So really, um, like I said, these are just some examples. This does not cover the entire gamut of things. And what we will do, and I'll talk about a little bit more later on here, is like, you know, how we can assess like, you know, what a reasonable accommodation is with an employer. So reimbursement limits are as follows. So the maximum total reimbursement an eligible employer could get between, you know, each state fiscal year. So that goes from July 1st of this or of 2023 to June 30th of 2024 is like $30,000. And this basically encapsulates like both one-time and ongoing reasonable accommodation expenses. Mm -hmm. But the rules for, you know, kind of what is what here are a little bit different, which I'll explain. So submissions for like a one-time reasonable accommodation expense, you know, must be at least $250, but you can only do like at maximum 15,000 per individual with a disability. So, you know, let's say that, you know, you have, you know, just one individual, they need that one-time expense, like a, a wheelchair ramp, then, you know, that would you would have hit your maximum for that particular employee. But let's say you have another employee with a disability who needs something different, like an ergonomic workstation. You can also, you know, apply for that because again, as long as you do not, you know, go over thirty thousand dollars, then things that you spend as a small to medium sized business will be refunded. However, on the other end, submissions for things like ongoing accommodation expenses don't have any sort of minimum or maximum expenses. So like, you know, things such as, like I said, sign language or job coaching, it could be something as small as $50 a month or obviously up to its max. But the only thing you have to keep in mind is that, you know, you can, there are no limits on how much you can like, you know, spend per month, but as long as it doesn't exceed that $30,000, then you're fine, okay? So going forward, let's talk about the process a little bit. So what happens? So obviously as an employer, your employee comes to you with, you know, saying, hey, I have a disability and you begin the internal process of confirming that doing whatever you need to do on your end. Then let's say like, you know, and I get this a lot where, you know, employers are really sometimes the employee does not know exactly what type of reasonable accommodation they need. So prior to you even applying for funds, you know, you can set up a free consultation one-on-one -on -one with me. And what we'll do is like, you know, we'll kind of talk about the ins and outs of how this program would help you as a business and, you know, figure out what are some, what are the reasonable accommodations that might help your employee, all right? So let's say we, you know, come to an agreement, yep, they need coaching or an ergonomic workstation, Yep, we could go ahead and do that. Then you make purchases as needed because remember this is a reimbursement program. So you have to purchase it beforehand before we can give you the money. So once you do that, then you complete the ERAF application on our website, All right? So one thing that I always like to stress is that when completing the application, you know, making sure that the employer attaches proofs of purchase, right? 
because obviously without proofs of purchase and everything is about documentation, we can't reimburse you. So once you get it to me, I'll review the application and usually get back to the employer within five business days. If the application is approved, I'll contact the employer to complete a substitute W-9 form, and the employer may be asked to register in SWIFT if they anticipate future reimbursements, right? So one thing that one person that we have not bought on yet, and I'll talk a little bit more about that as we keep going through, is our ERAF technician who will be like, you know, really working through the financial process of like processing payments and whatnot. We haven't, like the person hasn't gotten on board yet. We feel like, you know, they're going to be on soon. So we're looking at like mid-November here, but that's going to be something the ERAF technician will be. So it'll be that person and then myself running this program. All right. So the reason why we ask you to do it through SWIFT is because that's how our reimbursements are, you know, dispersed, right? So if you can set up, you know, as a supplier in SWIFT, funds can be, you know, instead direct deposit. All right. So let's say that, you know, sadly, we don't like to deny people, but sometimes that's just the nature of the beast, right? And here's some reasons for it, you know. You're, as an employer, you might be, you know, a little bit too, like, you know, larger than what we can service. We have to be very strict with, you know, the guidelines that are set here. Other reason, like, you know, your a reasonable accommodation may not be something that qualifies under, you know, definition of state law. And again, we have to be very careful about what we can and cannot approve here, just because, again, like, you know, as we're you know, going through this as a brand new program. Like I said, we want to help as many, you know, businesses and as many employees as possible, but we also have to be very detail oriented. So like, let's say that for another reason, like, and, you know, this could pop up from time to time, not for, you know, the accommodation wasn't meant for like a job applicant or an employee with a disability or, you know, you might've exceeded the $30,000 fiscal limit, which in that case, you know, you would have to wait and reapply again the next fiscal year if you have like exceeded your maximum. Or again, not so much an automatic denial here, but like it would be a denial, but it wouldn't be like, you know, the end of the world. Like if you're missing or having insufficient documentation or proof of purchase to just cost, you know. So usually in a case like that, after I look over applications, I usually try to reach out to the employer to really, really clarify like, okay, you know, we need this and this and this in order to move through. So, you know, but regardless, whatever your reason for denial is, as an employer, they have the right to appeal and there will be an appeal process that we would present to them, all right? So other things to kind of note here, like, you know, this reimbursement is not a taxable thing. So, you know, as an employer, you know, they still want to obviously consult with the tax accountant under this. Employers do not need to submit at any point proof of eligibility in terms of like, you know, the employee's disability. That's their business, that's confidential. You know, obviously, if somebody comes to us, we realize that they need our guidance here and we will do our best to try to provide. So. Another thing, like I said, like any other, you know, government program at any level, we have to provide quarterly financial audits of all reimbursements. And, you know, let's say that as an employer, like, you know, for whatever reason, like you did not meet all the requirements of the program, you might be required to return a portion of or all of the funds that you received. Like I said, we hope we don't have to do that, but just kind of putting out there what could be. So again, like I said, with technical assistance and consultation, that's something that you know we've made available to employers because we understand that this isn't just like, you know, a you know, one, two, three process here. Because we want to make sure that the employer understands, like, you know, all the things that you know they have access to to help, you know their employees and we want to make sure that as a program we are basically giving every you know eligible employer the
the maximum assistance that we can. So again, throughout this consultation, there might be things such as like, you know, kind of going through the ADA as it, you know, pertains to hiring and retaining individuals with disabilities. It could be something like, you know, consulting on how to locate, purchase, and implement reasonable accommodations that might meet the needs of individuals with disabilities. And if that's the case, you know, usually it won't just be myself, but it might be somebody like, you know, I might reach out to the STAR program here. I don't know how many of you are, you know, as familiar with that, but, you know, it could be I reach out to somebody else within SSB for, you know, who works in assistive technology. So, you know, if need be, like, you know, I would definitely connect with different, different people here in, in our department just to make sure that you got the best that you got. So, again, also, we would try to connect employers to disability-related trainings and resources, including these specific programs. And obviously, as part of this consultation, we would want to make sure that all an employer's questions are answered, you know, regarding ERAF, okay? So, Finally, being that this is a new program, we're trying to get it out there. And again, as part of, as like most of, like a good portion of my job as program coordinator is to do outreach, but cannot do it without you good people, right? So that's why we're available to present to staff, partners, employers, and anyone else who we feel or you feel might benefit from knowing this information. We also have a flyer that we can, that I can like, you know, share with you at the end of the meeting, along with contact information. But, you know, as it makes sense, we want to basically get this out there, whether it's like, you know, in presentations, newsletters, you know, gov delivery announcements, trainings, whatever, you know, we're just trying to get the word out there, you know, statewide, right? So then finally, and I'll make sure I, you know, include this in the chat after I'm done. Here are the websites you can access, you know, ERAF with, like, if it's a general question, usually this is the, you know, default email, which would go to my inbox and I would respond to you as needed. Also the main number, which also like, you know, comes to me. So I'll be the one taking the call as of now. Like I stated, I'm the program coordinator. We have not hired a technician quite yet, but it's coming close. So. Like I said, we anticipate, you know, we'll be starting pretty soon here. And my boss is Lindsay Hansen, who oversees not only this program, but other programs within SSB. All right. So with that being said, um, are there any questions or anything today? Some time for Q and A. As we wait for questions, I want to reiterate that. Um, um, these uh, folks that are on the call, you work with employers, you know people who are not going to work because they think that their uh, disabilities might be an a barrier for them. Uh, please do reach out. And this is uh, one of the programs that we are, we at the state are trying to uh, encourage folks to um, uh, get, uh, get to work without um, having this as a barrier. Uh, maybe I'll start with the first question, right? Um, I, when I was last listening to this uh, um, presentation, um, was so proud that we're one of the few states that have ever done this. Uh, do you do you have any idea across the country where we fall on this? We are the first. We are the. Wow. This is a pilot program here in Minnesota, and you know, hopefully, we would like to see this, you know, expand. That's one of the things that I'm excited about. You know down the line, but yeah, we're the first. And then uh, Michelle is asking if uh, the information that is contained in the links is available in other languages. Yep, I'm putting that in right now. Perfect. We'll share this links. Thank you, Michelle. Uh, um, Folks, any other questions for Roy before we move over to the other speaker? Yep. And like I said, if you um, can't think of anything right now, but think of something later, I'm also going to put my email here in the chat. Um, feel free to reach out to me. 
and let me know, like, you know, like I said, whatever question you might have later on, and I would be more than happy to answer. If I don't know the answer, you better believe I will bother somebody until I get it. So, you know, because we want this program to really, really, you know, expand. Thank you, Roy. Really uh, uh, amazing program. Um, and thank you. You know, welcome to Deed. You just joined recently, and we put you on the spot. But you have done extraordinary and amazed by um, um, uh, the team that's put together. And uh, we will we'll work closely to make sure uh, this does not become a barrier for uh, any Minnesota to get to uh, the work that they want to do. So uh, thank you so much. And I will follow up. Appreciate it. We'll move on to um, our dear friend, Lilian Otieno. She has some updates for the uh, emerging uh, farmer program. <clears throat> we do uh, want to highlight that um, a significant number of our, our communities or the immigrant and refugee communities have been um, diversifying into farming and Lillian has been a great part of that um, for so many years and uh, there's some more funding from the legislature this time as you can talk to us about the, the office and what, what we will be doing and an amazing uh, gathering that they will have soon. Thank you. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. Good Good afternoon and thank you Assistant Commissioner Mohammed, for uh, having me today. Uh, sorry, it's been one of those days and uh, I'm just logging in. So I missed the previous presenters uh, comments, but I'm sure that I'll, I'll get it in the, in the recording. Um, as the Assistant Commissioner has mentioned, my name is Lilian Otieno and I'm with the Emerging Pharma Office uh, here at the Minnesota Department of Agriculture. Uh, I think most of, most of you may be uh, perhaps familiar with um, what agriculture predominantly looks like in, in our state. And uh, our commissioner here, uh, Commissioner Peterson, made a very bold decision when uh, he brought on board Assistant Commissioner Patrice Bailey uh, to work on making sure that we are um, looking at what some of those barriers are for um, most underserved communities to participate in uh, agriculture in Minnesota. And so I won't go into the long story of how that came about. There were listening sessions and a report to the legislature, and then um, here we are. Part of that report generated also an emerging farmers working group, which consists of about 18, 19 members, uh, give or take. And those uh, folks come from communities or groups or individuals that represent uh, what we call emerging farmers or community of folks who have traditionally not um, accessed a lot of our programs and resources to be able to participate in agriculture in Minnesota. And so those are women, those are people of color, black indigenous uh, persons of color. Those are um, folks from um, communities that uh, have not really received a lot of resources, including um, those who identify as having a disability, those who identify as uh, being a part of the um, LGBTQI community, um, veterans, uh, and also anyone who has uh, either been farming or just started farming and is really uh, having a lot of issues in terms of accessing a lot of our programs. So you'll find that the Emerging Farmers Working Group uh, consists of uh, those individuals. We are at the fourth uh, cohort of that working group. We're just welcoming the new uh, working group members here. We'll be welcoming them officially on November, um, the first, second week of November. Uh, but since uh, this was stood up, we've had over 35 uh, people in that Emerging Farmers Working Group uh, representing about 32 uh, counties in Minnesota. So we're trying to also be geographical to make sure that um, the folks who are in the working group represent uh, a diverse part of, of our state. So 
this office uh, last in the last, last legislative session, we were successful to get some funding to expand this office uh, because it has just been myself as a full time uh, staff for this office. I've had some help on some of our admin folks internally and also working a lot with our stakeholders and partners. So we're happy to say that uh, we're in the process of expanding capacity for this office um, and those announcements will be made as we go through that process of increasing more staff to help do the work in this office. Um, additionally, um, this office has also been successful in uh, providing resources that we have listened to emerging farmers and they have told us some of the resources that they're mostly interested in. As I said earlier, um, agriculture is one of those uh, things that, uh, or industries that has predominantly uh, not been accessible to underserved communities. And so one of the issues with that is land access, right? It's the ability to find land to actually farm, but also the ability to have the capital to purchase that land where you want to farm. Uh, most of our uh, emerging farmers would rather farm closer to the urban areas or closer to metro areas, but land in those areas are sometimes very expensive. Uh, if you go out to the rural areas, you might find land. Uh, sometimes accessing is still difficult, but there's also other challenges that come with that in terms of either zoning issues, uh, but also other issues, including discrimination and not feeling welcome in some of those communities. So those are some of the things that this office deals with. One of those items that we're very proud of is a down payment assistance program. This was monies that were awarded uh, by the legislature. And in 2023, we had about $500 uh, on the first round, $500,000, sorry, on the first round of that where we, each, we had about 105 applicants and uh, 32 grants were awarded. However, at that time it became apparent to us based on feedback that a lot of the folks who needed those funds were not necessarily the recipients of those funds because of the way the grant was structured. So we actually went back to the legislature and asked for some updates and tweaks to that, where we managed to have um, we managed to have it in such a way that we could do a lottery system. So that allowed for us to be able to uh, have more people participate in that. And it was maybe more fair than first come first serve. We also had um, the legislature reduce the matching component for that grant. It was 15,000. 15,000 matching. That was a little steep for a lot of emerging farmers. So that was reduced to 8,000. And then also uh, we expanded the, the time frame for you to close on a sale, which initially was about three months, which was a, li was a little bit too difficult. And now the legislature allowed us to do six months with that. Um, we did do a second round of that funding in July, 2023. And we're getting ready to do a third round of the down payment assistance program in the fall of 2024. And for that, we have um, funding for about, the funding pool for that is about 1 million that we will be awarding, awarding folks. And it's still 15,000 is the cap uh, for that. And there is a matching, uh, matching requirement, which is going to be that 8,000. Now we haven't um, built that, uh, pro that grant yet for that third round, but we will be in the process of doing that. Addition to that, uh, based on the funding that we received from the legislature to expand this office, also came with funding for us to do two additional grants. One of the grants that we are going to be working on, nothing is already set in stone yet, but we know that one of those grants is going to be an equipment grant because we heard from farmers that yes, I get the farm, I get a place to farm, uh, but it's sometimes a big challenge in equipment, uh, getting equipment to either farm or uh, e equipment to be able to move product from one point to the other, or to just develop your farm in order to be successful. So we are looking, this office is looking at building out an additional two grants uh, that are going to speak to those needs uh, that farmers have. So 
those are exciting things and there's a host of other things that we are looking at. Of course, translation uh, is one of those areas where this office is working very diligently, uh, making sure that the MDA is uh, being responsive to acts, making sure that language is accessible. Uh, so we do have a standing funding that we get for translation services. So if we have any programs out there uh, or in situations where we are engaging with farmers, we wanna make sure that we are providing language access. And uh, finally, I wanna just uh, plug in uh, the Emerging Farmers Conference. This is a conference that is hosted by the food group. Uh, this conference has been in existence for almost 18, 19 years. I have been on that planning committee for seven years now. And this conference is unique because it brings in emerging farmers from all over the state, but also from outside the state. This conference actually provides language interpretation. At the conference, we always have upwards of nine to 10 different languages being interpreted at the conference. So it's a very unique and a very exciting place to be. But most exciting about it is that it focuses on emerging farmers. It focuses on those farmers who have traditionally not been able to get access or resources from those mainstream, um, mainstream opportunities. And this year we are very excited because um, U.S. Truly Assistant Commissioner Mohammed is going to join us in that listening session, which is going to happen on November 3rd at Mountsview Community Center. And that listening session is going to be the Emerging Farmer Office listening session hosting emerging farmers. And the Assistant Commissioner is going to be there to talk about uh, his role, talk about the Office of New Americans, and also talk about um, how uh, farm, your farm business, our emerging farmers farm businesses are also businesses that uh, did uh, would be able to have resources that uh, farmers can take advantage of. And we're going to have other guests with us there uh, who will also be providing resources to the farmers. We're going to have Kim Von Din, who is an assistant professor with uh, Mitchell Hamlin uh, Economic Inclusion Clinic. She's going to talk about um, uh, legal uh, representation for farmers and how farmers can can have pro bono receive pro bono services from the work that she is doing. Um, additional to that, we will also be providing a raffle, and so this is to to get you to want to attend this session. We will be offering, uh, or the conference, I should say will be offering 15 $200 gift cards. So come in and join us at this conference for also a chance to win a $200 gift card. Uh, but most importantly, we, we're designing a program to listen to farmers. We did this last year. We will talk about what we did with the feedback we got last year. And we will also have uh, activities to continue to listen to farmers and figure out how we can continue to be responsive to the needs of farmers uh, in this office. And we will have other announcements which are going to be more time sensitive uh, by the time we, we hit the conference on uh, November 3rd. The conference is two days. Uh, it is November 3rd from four to seven. Our session is from 5.30 to 7.30 uh, on that day, I'm sorry, four to eight o'clock. Uh, and the second day, November 4th, the conference starts at uh, 7.30 to six o'clock. It is free for farmers. So you can, um, if you're a farmer, you can register for free. Uh, otherwise there is a fee if you're not a farmer. And since I'm speaking alone, I will share that information with the assistant commissioner in those links and you'll find them in the notes. And with that, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much, Lillian. Um, any questions for Lillian? Perfect. Um, we'll, we'll follow up with you, Lillian, if there's any other <clears throat> questions that come up. And uh, I want to take uh, this time to kind of go back on two um, um, other uh, RFP programs that I have uh, 
um, mentioned in the start of the call and uh, really kind of um, highlight those uh, opportunities for our partners on the call and for those who will be listening on the uh, recording later on. Uh, the first one I talked about was the Drive for Five RFP initiative that is out there. And, um, you know, this is uh, from the legislator, you know, one Minnesota budget um, found out there's oh, five or proposed there are five high demand, high growth jobs uh, industries that uh, need, uh, you know, focus our state uh, to uh, recruit people to those five industries. We've had uh, those industries identified as um, it was uh, technology, trades, uh, caring professions, manufacturing and education. <clears throat> and through this RFP deed will, uh, fund, you know, partnerships that provide training you know, that lead to job placements in high demand, in demand occupations. Um, of course, while ensuring these uh, job quality and uh, recruiting diverse and, and, and representative uh, workforce in those industries. And um, the money is mostly for uh, one competitive grant for education and training. Uh, that will focus on training, you know, uh, some of those uh, programs that have uh, demonstrated partnership with employers, uh, providing jobs with family uh, sustaining wages. <clears throat> the other part is the competitive grant for trade associations or chamber of commerces. Uh, so there's some money for that. Um, and these are mostly for employer organizations that are partnering with nonprofit education or training organizations uh, that will participate in the program. And then, of course, it will also help hire and develop business service representatives for uh, the state for, for D. And so check out the website for uh, the request for proposal for Drive for Five. And then the other uh, program I wanted to also highlight was uh, um, from MDH, where we have a capacity strengthening initiative for, uh, uh, for partners that are uh, working in, in health so the Center for Health Equity is, you know, is announcing this RFP uh, for capacity strengthening grants uh, that will award about $1.8 million in, in state funds uh, to smaller community organizations and faith-based organizations serving the BIPOC communities, American Indians, LGBTQIA, and um, you know, people living with disabilities in the metro and of course rural areas. Uh, make sure to check that RFP out. It's uh, due by November 20. But this 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 is uh, one of the key uh, capacity uh, building grants that will uh, fund to strengthen the existing uh, community-based or you know faith-based organizations uh, to um, be successful in procuring grants and contracts at the MDH and support them in their ongoing efforts uh, to um, strengthen their work. Um, of course, you will be required to um, um, come up with that um, you know, plan uh, that will include three key objec objectives, uh, strengthening organization partnerships, um, infrastructure improvements, and of course, workforce development. So those are two um, key grant programs I wanted to highlight. And of course, we have other, other developments into the, um, across the state that we will also uh, do uh, share in, later on. Um, there's a lot of hiring that's that's going out this time. Please do check out mn.gov slash careers. And that way you can see all the departments and you can filter by department. And we will be um, happy to answer any questions that you will have. Um, this time I will invite any other updates, uh, open discussions from our um, you know, participants. If there's anyone who wants to share um, any, any upcoming program or any update for the uh, community, please feel free and welcome. Well, great. If there's no any other um, 
information or anyone who needs to share anything, we will be happy to end the call a little earlier and see you in our next meeting on the 7th of November. Uh, thank you so much for joining us and I'll be um, sending out the recordings and please also check our blog that we do uh, summarize what we have talked about uh, during this course. Uh, thank you again and see you um, next time. Until then, goodbye.